Thank you. Adrian Ann Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, February 5th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Buick City Council for February 5th, 2024. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Mayor Cavanaugh, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. And we do have one change to tonight's agenda. Action item number eight is pulled from the meeting. With that, we will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration, and consent items can be found on pages two through six of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have anyone who would like any of the consent items removed for separate discussion this evening? I see no one here in chambers. Do we have anyone virtually? We do not. Thank you. No input. Okay. All right, back to the table then. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Sprank. Aye. The motion passes 7 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing. We have eight. First is setting a public hearing to approve the Radford Road Urban Revitalization Plan Amendment 3 for February 19th, 2024. Second is setting a public hearing to approve the Alta Vista mm -hmm. Urban Revitalization Plan Amendment 1 for February 19th, 2024. Third is setting a public hearing to approve the Bees Drive Urban Revitalization Plan Amendment 1 for February 19th, 2024. Fourth is setting a public hearing to approve the Plaza Drive Urban Revitalization Plan Amendment 1 for February 19th, 2024. Fifth is setting a public hearing to approve the Dubuque Urban Revitalization Plan Amendment 1 for February 19th, 2024. Sixth is setting a public hearing for the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law State Revolving Fund Environmental Review Private Lead Service Line Repa Replacement Pilot Program for March 18th, 2024. Seventh is setting a public hearing to adopt the Public Housing Authority Annual Plan for Federal Fiscal Year 2024 for April 1st, 2024. And eighth is setting a public hearing to approve the revised administrative plan for the Housing Choice Voucher Program for April 1st, 2024. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for the dates specified. Second. Second. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Wethel, we'll say. 
Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Sprank. Aye. The motion passes 7 0. We'll move on to boards and commissions. We have applicant review for the Community Development Advisory Commission and the Transit Advisory Board. All right, so for the Community Development Advisory Commission, we have one three-year term through February 15th, 2027, and one applicant, um, Gerald Hamill. Do we have anyone here in chambers to speak about this application? Seeing no one here, do we have anyone virtually? No. Okay. No input received. Okay. All right, then our next one is the Transit Advisory Board. One three-year term through July 30th, 2026, and one applicant, Dora Serna. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this application? Seeing no one here, anyone virtually? Nope. Thank you. And no input. All right, thank you. All right, then we can move on. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to action items on the agenda. And I will just remind everyone that action item number eight is removed from the agenda. All right, thank you, Adrian. I saw somebody already getting up for public input, so I thought I'd just invite you up early. Um, for those of you, if there is other folks that would like to provide some public input tonight, feel free to come up to the front. You can sit in that front um, area there to be able to just be in line and, and ready to be next. And then um, if you would, just speak into the microphone and let us know who you are and your address, and we appreciate it. My name is Veronica McAvoy, and I live at 125 West 9th Street in the Henry Stout Senior Apartments. Um, I've lived in our building for 10 years. For a number of years, we've had issues with the roof and flooding in the building. At one point, the, the flooding from the roof in our building was so bad, it went through all four floors. Not a single floor was completely dry. When we went to the housing department, they condemned the, uh, one unit, and the tenant living there was made to move out of the building. Um, why our building had not received an exterior inspection, I don't know. Our out-of-state landlord, MDI, did nothing to fix the issue or keep us informed as to what was going to happen. Since that happened, little to no work was done on that unit or the building exterior. In 2022, they put scaffolding up on the east side of our building, but again, no work had been done. In April of last year, our building was bought out by Gronin, and stuff started to change around the building for the better, but we still don't know what improvements were to be made. January 31st, we got our first update. Notices were sent out to six residents, including myself, that our leases were being terminated April 30th because on May 1st, exterior work to our building was being done. When I called Gronin, we were told by an employee that the east and south walls were bowing, meaning our building is under threat of structural failure. Our apartment is finally being fixed, but now we have to move into different apartments. We don't know if we're going to be able to move into a unit in the building, whether we'll get a comparable unit or whether we'll have to move to a new apartment altogether. We're going to have to pay for a relocation, moving the internet, cable, and potentially storage for our things because we don't know if we're going to have a smaller unit bigger unit. This is in part because it took so long to identify this as an issue for 10 years. I've been living in this, in a structurally unsound building. Renters shouldn't have to live in danger like this. And that's all I Thank you very I much, have. Veronica, for your, for your comments. 
All right, other public input this evening. Hi, um, my name is Lorena Snyder. I live at uh, 889 Cottage Place, um, so over by Clark. Uh, I am here representing the uh, Dubuque Trees Forever um, part of the board. So this is in regards to the community project proposed at Caldonia Place. Um, so yeah, basically community orchard. Um, so it's something that could kind of greatly benefit the neighborhood around there. Um, I know there's a few schools up there. We've got a hospital, um, you know, a park that is currently being not utilized for anything. It's just grass. It's being mowed by the city. Um, there used to be trees there. We found some old aerial footage from like the 60s. Those trees don't exist anymore. Um, so instead of just letting a park kind of sit and wallow in grass, um, you know, this proposal to put it a community orchard could do a lot of good um, for not only the surrounding community, but for the city as a whole. Um, projects like these are usually they're just awesome. I mean, it helps bring people together. It's an educational component. Um, you know, it has the potential to provide uh, food for our local food banks. Um, yeah, it's just, it has the potential to be a really cool and interesting project. Um, in particular, I'm interested in it because I love agroforestry. I'm part of the board. I'm a certified arborist. Like, this could be a really great thing for the city. Um, one of the other things that we're kind of proposing for this as well is putting in a, kind of a pollinator garden in there. So working with mowing to monarchs um, and just increasing the amount of space available for native pollinators that are slowly running out of room in the city. Um, so anytime we cut down a tree, realistically, we should plan on planting a lot more and this would kind of help provide for that. Um, so with that space available, you could plant up to 30 trees in there, all of them fruit trees, all of them bearing. Um, yeah, I think it's just a really, Great project to potentially see in the community and just add another thing into the city of Dubuque's, um, you know, kind of wheelhouse. So, thank and you. You said Lorena? Lorena. Lorena. Like banana. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much yeah. for your comments. That says, oh, that's as long as it goes. Okay. So hello, my name is Nina Erba. I live on 180 West 15th Street, and I've spoken before on the subject of housing before the city council, but in the past, because this is a deeply personal issue for me, because I've been homeless for over a year and a half in the past, but what I probably have not shared is the reasons why I became homeless. The reason why I became homeless was because I had to leave my slumlord's apartment after getting bed bugs in that apartment for the third time, and initially they refused to do the actual, they refuse to do the, the spraying or control the bed bugs to make sure that my place was hospitable. It wasn't until I came to the housing department and got them on board to make sure that the place was properly, you know, livable that I could actually get the place sprayed in time so that I could be able to find a place. So move out, essentially that was couch surfing, but I digress. If it wasn't for the housing department, I don't know where I would be, if I would even be here today. So I'm grateful that the city is considering the increase of the, the rental and licensing fees to make sure that the city depart the housing department gets the money that they need to do their operations. But your the problem is, is you're only doing half the job because we have learned that you are not planning in the near future to hire any more city inspectors to inspect our rental units, which is a very big problem because we are lagging far behind in the terms of average rental inspection cycles behind similarly sized cities like Cedar Falls and Waterloo. And this is a huge problem because we are living in a crisis. I know we tend to throw around that word a lot, but this is a crisis. We live in a genuine housing crisis in our city, which is only getting worse. And I do not understand why we cannot find the money for more inspectors, especially when you're trying to raise the fees but plan not to do anything with them. It's like, what exactly are we raising fees for instead? So what we need to do is make sure that we get enough inspectors because we can't deal with this anymore. We are exhausted. A new report just came out that showed that half of US renters now are cost burdened, which means they're spending 30% or more of their income on rent and utilities. We are basically 
figuring out how to find enough money to both find a place to live and not starve. That's our reality. And I'm not certain if that's really coming across. So while we're figuring out how to deal with that dilemma, the least that all of you owe us is to make sure that we get our, prob our rental units inspected at a timely manner so we don't have to share that struggle with black mold and cockroaches. Thank you. Thank you, Nino, for your comments. Other input this evening? Thanks, Nino. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph Lewis, and I am a tenant at Bishop Block Apartment, which is also owned by Affordable Housing. And I am the president of the Tennis Association there. And some of the issues that we're having right now, uh, we're feeling neglected because the higher up, the managers, the owners, does not communicate with us. Uh, we had a, uh, we had a, a building manager, but she went to another job, so now we have someone part-time. We might see her once, maybe twice a week. So therefore, we are not able to go to them to you know, express issues that's going on in the building. So one of the problems is uh, we do have problems with bed bugs. Our elevator is so small that, uh, well, half the time it don't work, but it is so small, only one wheelchair at a time can fit in the elevator. So that's a fire hazard. Also, we do, uh, we had two different uh, entrance and exits, but they shut one off. Now, uh, it's on the emergency exit. If someone go through that, emergency exit, they charge us $50. They've been going up on rent every year. Uh, we're, most of the people there are on fixed income. It's a low income. And so those are some of the issues that we're facing right now. They installed a, they're in, in the process of installing a air conditioned unit throughout the whole central air. Uh, before then, we were all using window units. But the problem is, you're installing central air. That's only going to affect the tenants because the window seals are, doesn't have seals around it. You can literally stand in front of my bedroom window and feel the cold air coming in. So, you know, if we're paying for heat, it's going right out the window. So the same thing will happen with the central air. They, not one tenant in the building asks for central air. They need to start fixing the things that need to be fixed, you know, that's gonna benefit us daily instead of creating things to spend money on. So that's one of our problems that we're dealing with right now. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if it's uh, against the law or what, but it seems like to me that the tenants should be able to uh, communicate with the landlord. They, they get our check every month on time. They get our rent every month on time. It seems like they should interact with the tenants. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Joseph. Sorry. Um, my name is Jaime Uh I live at uh, 1394 Locust Street. That's uh, Ward 4. Um, I, uh, I do like community orchards, but uh, I'm here uh, with uh, Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement to talk about uh, rental licensing fees and the rental inspection program in Dubuque. Um, yeah, so over the past year, um, my organization and its volunteers, many of which are in the room, have uh, knocked thousands of doors. 
in Dubuque, right? Thousands. Um, and um, I can tell you that negligent landlords are falling through the cracks, right? Um, there are landlords in our community who are engaged in bad business practices and violating health and safety codes. Um, and they get away with this because many in their apartments are unaware that they can file a housing complaint or they are too scared. In the memo from city staff uh, that you'll see, uh, Dubuque is not up to par with the rest of the state on housing inspections, right? With the average being three, uh, three years between inspections, with Dubuque being, uh, according to the memo, at 4.5 years. Um, yeah, I, I think it honestly, it saddens me uh, and it frustrates me that um, we live in a city um, that has less and more population than other cities on this list. Um, yeah, um, you know, the last time an additional inspector was hired in Dubuque, uh, it was because we were falling behind on the five-year cycle, um, right? So um, any, any capacity um, that's been added to our housing department has purely been to meet the falling standards that we've set for ourselves, right? Um, and it's no surprise that the, the tiered inspection program is, is great, right? And it's doing good work. Um, and I think we've seen many landlords on that list work towards not having to be inspected every year. And that's the kind of progress that we definitely want. But those only represent 600 units in the city, in a city of 15,000 plus units, right? A growing number of units. Um, I guess the, the, the frustrating piece is that 90% of the cost of these inspectors is funded by rental licensing fees because the city is providing a service to landlords and renters alike. Um, and, and with a uh, $139 million operating budget in 2023, I really don't understand why we can't come up with $15,000 annually to hire these inspectors, right? Um, 15 to 20,000 a year, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just don't know how long we have to wait for a fully funded department. I can tell you that while CCI works year round, we can't fulfill the need that the housing department can. Um, yeah, and, and 3.75 uh, full-time equivalent inspectors cannot possibly oversee 15,000 rental units in a timely or effective manner. Um, yeah, and I think um, a lot of the stories that are being shared tonight are good examples of, of that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jaime, for your comments. My name is Zoe Fortson, and I live at 299 Main Street. I'm here today to talk about the rental, rental licensing fees and the community call for more rental, rental inspectors while within the housing department. I have been a renter in Dubuque for a year and a half, and in that time, I have lived in two units. Prior to renting in Dubuque, I did not know much about renting. Now I've experienced how hard it is to find and secure a quality unit. This past fall, before I found my, my most recent apartment, I toured several units. The biggest challenge was finding a unit that was large enough for my family, but also within my price range. Several of the units had what I felt were safety hazards. One of the apartments I toured had a damaged railing that had clearly been like that for some time. Time and again, Dubuque renters have to try and find a balance between affordable rent and dignity. No one here would want their children to walk up and down stairs with a railing that might give out. These dilapidated units and the lack of affordable housing that is safe and dignified is in part because of the long-standing underfunding of Dubuque's housing department. We need a more frequent rental inspection cycle and an adequately funded housing department. The need for work of groups like CCI and Friends of Fair Housing are a result of gaps in the housing department. We are left to take on the cases of renters that are too scared to file a complaint and have gone years without a rental inspection. I'm asking the Dubuque City Council to treat renters like myself with respect and to include our needs in the city budget. We need two more housing inspectors. We shouldn't have to wait more years for our inspection cycle to be up to par with the rest of the state. Thank you, Zoe, for your comments. Any others? Hi. I'm Becky Sisko. I live at uh, 1205 Pamela Court. And I'm privileged to wake up in a home every morning that's safe and comfortable and warm. 
I read recently, and actually I was pretty much around at the time, that in the early 1970s, Dubuque tore down 128 buildings because they were, the reason giving is because they were slums. I'm sure there were more reasons for this, but we don't want to go back to that time. We want people to be able to be, live in safe, decent housing. That's it. Thank you, Becky, for your comments. Anyone else? Do we have anyone virtually? No. Okay. Anyone from the city clerk's office? No, no input. Okay. Last call before we move on to action items. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your comments. We can go ahead and move on. Action item number one is proposed rental license fee increases for February 2024. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. And the receiving file, the documents, and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Mike, please. The manager, Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council approve the recommended rental license and inspection fee increases as proposed to be effective for the calendar year 2024 licensing fees and effective March 1st, 2024 for inspection fees. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Comments and questions? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I, I support this, of course. Uh, folks, I hope you understand this is catching up to where we should have been. Um, the things that we're talking about with the possible need for additional inspectors will be considered in the budget process coming up very, very soon. Um, I also want you to understand that uh, because of things being tossed at us from the state of Iowa, that it's going to be really hard to add anything to anywhere this year. Um, our taxing authority has been threatened and reduced. Our, our ability to, to grow programming is, is uh, in tough straits. Um, not unsympathetic to, to what you're talking about, um, but there is some, we need people to not be afraid, and I, I appreciate you knocking on doors and, and telling people that to make the call, because two of the stories we heard tonight were about deplorable conditions that got better once a phone call or a, or a complaint occurred. Um, and that's, that's what we hope happens. We hope it doesn't get that bad in the first place. Um, but uh, certainly give us a chance to, to fix things. Um, per capita, we're pretty weak on city employees across the board from the city manager's office to parking, to fire, to police, every single department because we try and run a very austere, cost-effective organization. I guess the other thing that, that is gonna come into our thoughts as we consider um, rental housing fee increases to offset inspector costs is who do you think actually pays that? Um, it's going to be the renter is going to pay more rent to pay for that increased fee. So that, that's just part of the balancing act that we have to consider when we're figuring this all out. So I appreciate your comments tonight. Um, this is about closing a gap that we're going to find ourselves in, not being able to afford the inspectors that we have right now. And this is kind of a, I won't call it an emergency um, correction, but it's a very important correction. And that's all this proposal tonight is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Jones, Ms. Wethel. I just have some questions, maybe Alexis, you'd be best to answer. I think my question is, um, clearly our peers are reviewing properties every three years. What, what will it take for us to get to that threshold? Or what are the boundaries to that? Is it personnel? Sure, um, some of it is basically the um, behaviors of landlords and how many reinspections a inspector needs to complete. Um, if we're on a reinspection, we can't get to a new inspection for another unit. So um, what's happened over time is those reinspections have been decreasing. And that's um, the fees that the city council approved back in 2019 helped with that, uh, making it cost nothing if you pass your first inspection, but then $85 for every other inspection, trying to incentivize passing a unit up to code the first time we're there to free up some of that personnel time. Um, so the barriers really still exist that that time's important for inspectors. Um, we were aiming for five years when we added the inspector 
um, previously in a budget. And we got to five years and we're actually down to four and a half. And we have now scheduled inspectors, inspectors to get us to four. So we know in the next couple of months we'll be down to four, four year cycle. Um, we have about another year that we do think with our current personnel we can get to the three year cycle based on landlords passing their inspections at the rate that they're currently passing, which is much better than it used to be. Um, with that, we don't want to promise a three year with just the personnel we have, but we do think we can get there. What I caution is hiring an inspector to try to get us quickly to the three year cycle because we must train and the cost is very high. And then we will not need that inspector when we get to the three year cycle because we will have be visiting units more often, they will pass more often, and that inspector will be idle. So um, it would be one of those things that would be tough if we had to hire an inspector and then a year from now say, well, thank you for all of your work and all of the money we put into training you for this work, but you're not needed anymore. Um, we could do it. It's not impossible, but it's not something that we would recommend to council because we do think we can get really close, if not to a three-year cycle with our current inspection um, staff. One barrier, one thing that we'll see different by getting to that three-year cycle is that our inspectors do help with really difficult cases across departments. So the health department does um, inspections and the planning department does inspections. And when they get really, really difficult, they have one or two enforcement officers that don't do those difficult things. We do them on a regular basis. We do support those. Um, if we have to go in for warrants, if we have to go in for hoarding, we're supporting that work. Uh, we would have to rely back on those um, employees from other departments to pick some of that up while we get to that three-year cycle. Okay. I've got another question, but I'm not sure how to phrase it yet. So if someone else has a question, I'll let them Mr. Mayor. That's good. Yeah, Ms. Farber, go so, ahead. Um, I am a landlord, and um, I have been extremely impressed with the inspectors as we have been um, touring the buildings or the homes that I have or the apartments that I have. And um, they are extremely well-versed uh, in um, all aspects, whether it's electrical, whether it is um, construction, or just basically windows and how they should be opening or closing. And one of the things that I um, enjoyed about this was the opportunity to do the picture reinspection. So in other words, if I had to figure out how to um, increase a fan in a bathroom or do something that was just a one-off, then they would say, okay, fine, just send me a picture when it's completed, and then the inspection would be approved. Um, so I greatly appreciate that, and I very much appreciate the expertise of those professional inspectors. Um, I do have a question, though, to kind of help with the audience questions here. How many inspections uh, does the city do every year, and what kinds? Uh, because I know that there's individual homes that are rented out versus tenant um, apartment buildings, et cetera. Sure. We do anywhere from 2,600 to about 2,800 inspections in a, in a year. Uh, that's currently under what would be considered the five to four and a half year cycle. Um, several of those inspections are for housing choice vouchers. They have to be inspected every two years. So if you're accepting a housing choice voucher, voucher, we are in more often than just a regular cycle. Um, also, if you move into a, a new unit as a housing choice voucher holder, we're being inspected. And we have about 140 this year that were inspected because they were new to the housing choice voucher program. Um, those inspections are free and are required to be paid for by the federal government. So those are not paid for as part of these fees when it comes to the housing choice voucher side. Um, the number of inspections for single family versus multi-unit, I don't have your percentage, um, but single family does take us more time than the multi-units to inspect. The multi-units are, um, they're usually set up very similarly. We're expecting the same type of systems. We're inspecting one major system for the, um, the entire building, whereas a single family home, you're inspecting it, all of the electrical, all of the everything. So it does take us longer to do a single family home that is rented um, on average, and not so much for those multi-families. So on your the, the license fees, why is the inspection at zero? All the first inspections are part of your rental license fee and free, and that's to incentivize meeting code the first time. All right. Well, thank you for those answers, and I hope the facts are helpful for folks here. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Resin, can I see your Yes, thank you. So, Mr. Van Milligan, uh, is this uh, sort of like an enterprise fund where you would like uh, the fees to cover the costs of the service? 
Well, um, sort of is the right word to say because um, as uh, one of the speakers mentioned, our goal is to cover 90% of the cost through the uh, licensing and inspection fees. The other 10% are covered by the general fund. And the reason for that is because it, uh, the duties of the inspectors is not 100% only rental inspections. As um, Alexis Steger pointed out, they have some other duties they have to accomplish. And sometimes they have to inspect uh, owner-occupied homes, which have nothing to do with rentals. All right, thank you. And so the, the rates that we were charging were an estimate, and then we've gone through and we've, we've seen that um, that's not going to cut it uh, in today's world. So we are, adjusting, um, we are adjusting up to make sure that they are 90% covered. Yeah, so we're seeing that about halfway through our fiscal year, so our fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th, that the uh, amount of the fees are not covering 90% of the cost. The other thing is we only send out the rental license uh, renewals once a year, and it's going to be sent out in February. And so if we didn't come to you to increase the rental license fees now, we wouldn't have an opportunity to get any additional revenue from rental licensing until February of 2025. So we want to get that fee increase uh, instituted before we send out the February billing. All right, thank you. And um, Steger, the, uh, how many, and how, do you, um, how many rental units do we have? And maybe it's hard to tell. Um, uh, what, what is your guess for how many rental units we have? So licensed, we have just over 11,000 that are licensed, and that includes things like dorm rooms. Um, that also includes ones that have a rental license that have a voluntary vacancy agreement with us, meaning they'll stay vacant until either they're up to code or they just don't want to rent it right now, but they want to rent it soon, so they keep a rental license. There's about five to <coughs> 600 of those at any given time that have voluntary vacancies but carry a rental license. But that all, all those added together is 11,000. So... Uh do you need a rental license to rent your property? You do if you want to rent for 30 days or longer. So if you want to rent for less than 30 days, then um, Iowa law does not allow us to consider that a rental, and you do not need a rental license. I was just wondering because I thought it was around 11,000, but it was said that it was 15,000. Mm -hmm. And where would that number come from? I'm not sure. I mean, we are increasing. Uh, obviously, we've got developments that are underway. They're not um, issued yet, and they wouldn't be considered in our rental license, but it wouldn't be 4,000 different. So we're just above 11,000 today. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Roussel, yes. Thank you. I have a couple of comments and a question for um, Alexis. Uh, first, is, I think it's important to mention the many things that we are doing to bring more affordable housing to our community. Um, and I think um, the statistics um, will show many more units in the works, but of course that's not helping anyone right now, but we know that, that the things we are doing are bringing more units to our community. Um, second, I was glad to see that the um, recommendations included working with the landlords to see, you know, hey, what do you think about this? What could we do to make it better? Because if the landlords um, uh, know what we're doing, um, perhaps then it's going to be uh, better for their tenants. But my question for you um, is, I heard several people mention tonight that they had difficulty in just in communicating with their landlord, that they, they don't know how to call the person or the person's not responsive. Does your department help with that kind of thing? Or w what can we do to help those kind of situations? Those are difficult situations because the relationship is a civil relationship between the two. But what we can do is if someone calls and says they haven't been responding um, and I have an issue or um, they just haven't been responding, do I have the right phone number? We do have the rental licenses required to have the property manager or who is responsive and responsible for the unit on file. So we may have a newer number that we can also provide to them to or a new contact information if they have a new email. Um, so we can provide that information, but also if they're not responding for a concern, um, that's something that we would then go out and inspect and say, yeah, there is a concern out here and you've attempted 
through whatever means to contact your landlord, they're not responsive. So then that's when we step in um, on a what we call a complaint inspection. And they will be billed for a complaint inspection if they weren't responsive. If they were responsive, then we don't bill for that, even though we came out just to make sure that everything was okay. Okay. Um, it, my other question was, um, it seems like our goal should be to get more units to pass inspection on the, on the very first visit, which means, number one, the unit is in good condition for the renter that's living there, and it allow us to inspect more units every year, and then uh, I think it would allow our staff then to get uh, closer to that three to four year cycle that you want to get to. Um, so what, is there anything we can do to incent our landlords that we aren't currently doing to, to get more of our units to pass inspection on the first time? Mm -hmm. What can we do to make that happen? Sure. Um, we have released a checklist um, for landlords and we have um, sent that to the Dubuque Area Landlord Association to say here's the things that are the most common issues that we see fail um, so that the landlords can go in and be proactive. Um, inspectors are pretty uh, good at understanding if they did that, did that or not. Um, and when they haven't made that effort and then they're having to reinspect more than once, um, that's when we start moving to municipal infractions. And so we are on the enforcement side trying to incentivize as well if you didn't do it and you also didn't pass your inspection, we're starting to get to those citations. Um, the other things that we've done to try to help with that is um, providing the kind of consultation if landlords don't know what to look for. So new landlords go to this successful property management class. It's not called that. It's very close to that. <laughs> um, and so all new landlords have to go to that class. And if a landlord has shown um, that they've gotten several municipal infractions or they're just not understanding the code or maybe tenant treatment's not great, we can um, and we have put in their municipal infraction that the result is you must go back to that class. So um, redoing that and we have some going back through and going, you know what, I forgot. I haven't done this in 15 years and love it like the class. Um, we have an attorney come and speak as well to help with some of the civil side. Um, there isn't a ton of proactive part otherwise. So those are our proactive pieces uh, with the landlords. So we meet with the Dubuque Area Landlord Association on a regular basis, uh, their board, to make sure that they, if they have any questions about new codes, we present the new codes to them as well. Um, we also go to their full membership uh, when requested to present on whatever issue they may come up with or if they have questions. So we are trying that proactive side as well. Thanks. Yep. Excuse me. The, sorry. The other thing I would mention is something that Alexis mentioned earlier is uh, the way we uh, charge for the inspection. So the city council actually changed this policy several years ago. We used to charge for the first inspection and then the first reinspection was no charge. And the council switched that where the, the regular inspection is no charge. That's part of the licensing fee. And re, any reinspections, including the first one, there's a charge, which creates a financial incentive for the landlord to pass the first time. I don't, I don't know if you can answer this last question, but do, do we know how many of our landlords are active in that association? Um, are, is there a large percentage of them that meet together, or is it just a few top people? I haven't seen their 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 membership uh, roles in a while, but we do see, um, I can attest to the fact that a lot of our many unit landlords are part of the association. So those that have the, you know, several, several units and then represent a lot of our renters are part of that membership. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Sprinkler. Thank you, Alexis. And uh, thank you for folks that came tonight. Um, a few questions. Five to six hundred abandoned units. Do the do these owners ever say why they want to let their units just sit empty? Or so in that five to six hundred, it could be for a lot of different reasons. Some will rehab, and so they'll keep their rental license, and for six months they're working on a rehab to renovate. 
Um, some will do an Airbnb, but sometimes an Airbnb, if you go over 30 days, you got to have a rental license, but they don't think they're going to, but they pull one anyway. Um, we consider those, those they, they're basically vacant until they have an over 30 day and we need to actually enforce. Um, we have places like Butterfield Apartments that we've enforced on and so you cannot reside there and they're working on the renovation. There was an ownership change to try to facilitate that it's a big dollar renovation. Um, and that can be up to a couple hundred units on that list. Um, so there are a lot of different reasons you could be in that. Um, they have the option to withdraw the rental license when it's vacant. And so it's actually a positive thing when they leave it on a rental license. So those are positive um, that they're going to turn it over and they do want to rent it again. Okay. Um, walk me through like that whole, the three tiered process. Like, um, so say there is an individual that's still on it. What, and may, this might turn be some of involvement, what are our legal things that the city can do to, to basically force these folks to do anything? Like we've learned with, like as we've learned with the next item that it's not very easy to get somebody with a big a vacant building to do things with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to see with people living in it, the, diffic the legal difficulties that we've, that we as a city can help these citizens with. Sure, uh, we've done a couple that weren't as responsive. So most of our prior to category landlords actually were very responsive. They started selling down to what they could actually manage. They started rehabilitation, um, kind of stepped it up, right? And we had a couple that did not. The couple that did not, um, we encouraged their, um, hey, if you can't handle their sale, there's not rentals. There's a couple that tried to continue on with squatters or others and became a nuisance. When it kind of gets to that point of nuisance and squatters, it is something that we go in and um, cite for whatever it is. In a couple of the cases, if the unit is actually out of code, we have the condemnation that we can uh, impose. Um, and then anyone that continues to stay in the unit can be cited. We don't usually use that because why punish the tenant for the situation in which they were placed? Um, but we can cite the owner for occupying a condemned structure. So that is something that we have used in the past um, and has helped us kind of turn over. We have the ability then if they turn it over and leave it vacant and it's dilapidated to petition for the property since they're not paying any attention to that um, rehabilitation. So we've used that as well. Um, our tiered system uh, is something that we're looking at. So if that's prior to category, our tiered system is something we're looking at. Tiered one, um, our tier one eligible properties immediately dropped off of tier one, and so we have no one eligible right now for that status. Our tier two are our normal cycle, and our tier three often became our, pro our priority categories. So we don't see a ton of benefit in that process right now, and we're reevaluating re how to make that uh, stronger with other legal means, uh, which I don't know if Krona has any offer hand, you know, top of her head, but there are other legal means we can use. So Beyond the petition process, there are other legal remedies um, out there, but they are, the best way I can think of to describe them is extremely complicated and less desirable in many instances, simply because of the burden of making the case and then the way it, um, uh, the code requires certain things be handled. Um, but what we have done um, is try different things with different individuals because sometimes we have to keep trying different things until we find the thing that works, right? So for some, um, it's daily monetary penalties because it, for them it's about the pocketbook. And for others, th there are different things that motivate them or in some cases we discover that nothing motivates them, which is how we end up at the petition process. So sometimes what it is is putting five or six of us together in a room saying, okay, we've tried this and we've tried this and we've tried this. Where does that leave us? And of course, the last question, because we're having, you're going to be doing budgeting and you're thinking hypothetically, hypothetical, what would the cost of another inspector, re, like what would that add to your budget? Sure. Uh, it's about 120,000 to add an inspector with all of their equipment, car, and training. Ms. Well, back to you. Um, okay, I think I know how I want to ask my question, sorry. Um, how do our rental fees, even the proposed ones tonight, 
How do they compare to our like city peers? Sure. <coughs> So we did run these comparisons um, this week, and uh, they're very similar, but also not. So Iowa City is our most comparable city um, when we look at structure and amount. When you start getting into other cities like Cedar Rapids, they have fees for everything. Uh, you want to come to miss your inspection and reschedule, we're going to charge you $100. If you, it's behavioral type fees that start hitting all of the books. However, they're about at about $100 for things like going out to an inspection. So when we compare the fees, they don't have comparable fees because they don't match up. But when you talk about the time for an inspector to go out and find that fee, it is at about $100 for like Cedar Rapids, Iowa City. Um, Davenport's a little lower, but their inspection process is totally different than ours. Okay. And then I understand, and if you could speak a little bit about, um, I have a great concern about our disparity between our peers and the, th the three-year versus five-year. And so you feel as though if we hired another person, a year from now we wouldn't need them. I know we have, and I hope and pray that we have all these hundreds of units coming on the market. I know we won't need to inspect them for a period of time after their initial inspection when they are opened as units. Could you speak a little bit about that process mm -hmm. and where that timeline will be? Because I'm, it feels a little bit like we need more people. And I, I understand that if in the short term, a year from now, we might not need as many people. But boy, it feels like we're going to need people. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, we have. Um, so when you get a new development, come online. An inspection is done for the occupancy. And the occupancy, uh, certificate of occupancy, goes through all of the building codes. So you're meeting code the moment we give you the certificate of occupancy. So from that date, when we set your, if you're going to rent, um, we set your rental date. So if we're at a three-year inspection cycle, we would not inspect new units coming online for at least three years. Um, if our inspection cycle is longer, if we stay at five, it'd be five. Um, so that's how that process works, because all the codes are checked when we let them actually have an occupancy certificate. Um, that process for occupancy doesn't happen until completion of the building, unless there's some reason they're doing phases. So um, if Fox Hills may do a phase and one building will get their certificate occupancy, and then another building will get it, and so those will be staggered inspections in the future for when they come online for their certificate of occupancy. Um, that's kind of the process going forward when we talk about why we don't feel like we need one right now, a new inspector. We also have um, an inspector too who is in between and he does work for building permits in rental units, but he also can do rental license inspections and reinspections and all those other things. And so allocating that time um, back over to get us to the three-year cycle and then having those reinspections kind of drop off because the units are meeting code allows them to kind of move back into that building permit side and fluctuate. And so we have that ability already built into our department. Um, and to more to evaluate it more just seems prudent because we could probably get there with what we have. And then in three years, if we have 1,100 more units, that would be the time to be like, there's 1,100 more units. We really need another inspector. And so the boundary to keeping us from going to a three-year inspection at this time is reallocating the time of employee? Yes. Is there anything that council needs to do to confirm that we will be at a three-year cycle? Um, we, we could get guidance today from council saying we want a three-year cycle, get there. And then if we're not getting there, we'd have to come back to council with the proposal for additional labor if that's not a possibility. Okay. We think it is. Okay. I'd like to know, I think, if anyone um, has an interest in discussing that further, if there is an interest in supporting this, if we could come together and agree that a three-year cycle is the most appropriate. I think without question, our peers are doing it. Um, I just, I don't know the process from here. So what I, would, what I would point out is that the agenda item that we're talking about is a specific one. You making that statement, we've heard it and it's helpful. 
but I think an appropriate time for us to be able to speak about that, unless we put a specific agenda item on an agenda to have that specific discussion, we are coming up on a very appropriate time with the budget cycle. I mean, that's where we can have a, a much more far-reaching discussion about what each department needs, get the full layout of what you actually have going on, look at your budget more closely, be able to see it, be able to have that for everybody to see. And we're literally a month away from it. So I think, um, and, and Krenny, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but I would caution us against moving outside this agenda item tonight to, to, to move in a different direction on anything um, and, and talk about a different subject that you've brought up. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you can't ask the question you just asked. Mm -hmm. It just means that we probably shouldn't straw poll ourselves on that item right now. That's, that's something we should do during the budget process. And the other piece is just a reminder, um, you will get a memo from me leading into budget that talks Trina, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Thank How's you. That? Is that That's better? better, yeah. Sorry, sitting too far back. <laughs> um, just as a reminder, you will all be getting a pre-budget memo from me that explains the process so that if you want to set something aside, add something, shuffle something, or do whatever it is that y'all proposed to do, um, the memo was going to outline that process and what that looks like and the different methods with uh, how that can be done. So that um, will be coming out in the weeks leading up to when budget cycle starts. And our first meeting, if I'm not mistaken, is the 7th of March, where we initially, really the kickoff for the budget discussion. I just know that because I looked on my calendar today. So it's, it's, it's the 7th of March. It's actually, um, that's when we we have to, by state statute, um, set the uh, initial um, the the initial property tax rate. So, okay, thank you. I'm seeing shaking heads from the people who actually know what they're talking about. So, thank you very much. Okay, so so if I may just um, say a few more things. Um, so, in looking through the paperwork for this agenda item, of the 14 like cities, the average is 3.04. If we take out Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, Davenport, Sioux City, that number actually drops to 2.8 years. And that's considering the longest span of inspection. Um, and then if we consider the landlords who are in priority categories, and I just want to say you guys have been great about giving us all this information. So I, I've asked a lot of questions this week, but thank you. So the priority categories, um, I asked questions about that and who, where those, where those properties are. So meaning they have had three municipal infractions reported in the last 12 months. Here in Dubuque, it's estimated that 80 to 90% of those properties lie in a low to moderate income census tract. Those are properties that are reported. However, tonight and in the past, I've been told that there's a number of people who fear reporting. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we could shorten that, we can be taking action instead of waiting for people to have to fear for their housing security and reporting those infractions. And so um, really we're thinking about taking care of by equity, the most housing insecure and the most financially insecure of the people in our city. In the whole Dubuque vision statement, we want our residents to have quality, affordable, livable neighborhoods. I understand the reasons for raising the fees at this point, but I have to say, I just feel uncomfortable without a confirmation of three years that I, I don't feel like I can support this tonight, not because I don't believe that your staff does everything you should do. I really question how much we've put into the department and what we need to do in the future. And Mr. Jones is 100% correct. We're gonna have to make really hard decisions and budget. But to me, this is a priority decision of equity. And so um, I feel like I can't support it at this time, but. I really look forward to conversations if this does pass about how to get us to three years if my colleagues don't agree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
First of all, let me say thank you to everybody who is um, here tonight to provide some input on this item and, and things related to this item. I think you, you've, you've started a discussion at the same time that we were having this discussion on the agenda tonight, and I appreciate the fact that you've shown up um, and continue to show up. I think it's, it's really important that we hear from you about these issues that, that you're facing on a day-to-day -day basis and figuring out how we can work together to try and, and come to a real solution that will work for everybody. Um, because I think in, the, in general, I'm, I'm Actually, I'm convinced that we all want the same thing. We want safe, affordable housing for people who live in our city. So I appreciate that, that you're all here for that. Um, Alexis, and thank you very much for um, spending time answering our questions this week, but then also um, working on this. Um, I have a lot of questions. I think a lot of them are going to be saved for the, the budget cycle because they're more general. Um, it is, you know, I, I always say every year I really appreciate the opportunity for us to look at every single department in detail. And, and I hope that, that the folks that uh, spoke up tonight will be a part of that conversation as well, because I think it, it gives us the opportunity to really see the full picture of what's really going on. Um, it's hard for me to, to land on one side of the issues that are, that are laid out tonight, because I don't feel like I have all the facts quite yet. I feel like I need an update from you on how the, the tiered priority inspection situation is going. I heard you say tonight that you're, you're looking at that again a little bit more, but I know every year for the past couple of years, you've given us an update on, on how that's working, what that means, because it is different. I, quick question here, does anybody else have that in Iowa? Is this, are we the only ones that do something like that or is that a common thing across the state? You'll see that uh, depending on types of uh, units, mm -hmm. other cities will have different inspection schedules. And it's, it was in some of the stuff that we provided this week that some will be at like six months, two years, depends. And so that, that's their version of a tiered inspection program. So there are some that have a version of it, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so so you, you mentioned earlier, comparing ourselves to other cities is never an apples to apples approach. So we kind of have to we kind of just have to basically make sure we're doing what we need to do to keep our housing safe. I mean, we need to compare ourselves to ourselves and make sure we're doing the best we possibly can. Um, I am very concerned about um, some of the comments tonight and then other comments that I've heard in the past of people who, who are uh, afraid to speak up or who have not spoken up. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I know you're doing a lot to try to, and, and we as a city are doing a lot to try to get people to be able to report things. Can organizations report or can other people report deficiencies or concerns on behalf of a resident if that resident allows it? Or how, how does that work? Yes and no. Um, that's a little complicated. If they have knowledge of the, the unit, so they have, hey, the person in the unit has reported it, is afraid to report it. Um, it's something we can go out on. We wouldn't call it a complaint inspection just because we can't confirm if they've talked to the landlord or not. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are just a person that's been driving by and you're like, hey, I think that place doesn't look very nice, sure. um, you don't really have knowledge of what's inside, that wouldn't be something that would queue up um, necessarily an inspection. It might queue us up to drive by and see what you're seeing, but it wouldn't necessarily queue up an inspection. Um, so sometimes those outside organizations just don't have enough information to queue up a full inspection, but we will go and check it out outside to see if there's a reason to queue it up. Um, those are just policies to try to protect both landlord and the renters um, the best that we can. Those policies can be revisited. Um, we have heard this year, unfortunately, that there's been several instances of retaliation from landlords um, when we come in and, and do a complaint inspection. Um, unfortunately, we talked to Iowa Legal Aid and they don't take those cases because they're, they're fruitless. Unfortunately, landlords have the power. Um, you can bring it before the judge. However, they can evict you in the meantime and you're out on the street with no home. Um, the retaliation's already happened and the penalty is two months worth of rent, which is nothing. So really not, so they don't even take on the cases because it doesn't help the tenant. So retaliation is actually happening. Unfortunately, Iowa Legal Aid can't help and so we're trying to do the best we can to not put tenants in that situation. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very concerning. Yeah, Mr. Jones. That, that raises the question, uh, who determines that it's two months rent? Is that a city ordinance or is that a state? State law. <clears throat> yeah, the, the Iowa legislator controls controls that, and that's why Iowa Legal, Iowa Legal Aid has not that many hours, and so they service the biggest impact for, for tenants that they can, and that's not one of them based on the law. And as soon as, I'll ask Krenna, as soon as we uh, would try and create an ordinance to 
to create some significant penalties for retaliation. Um, we'd probably get preempted in Des Moines anyway in a couple of months. Sadly, I, th I think you would see a, a reactionary response, yes. Okay. While I'm talking, I'll just keep going for one more <laughs> comment. Um, please don't be afraid to, to call our housing department, and I, I get the retaliation threat could be real. Don't be afraid to call us either. Um, I mean, we're a voice that, that uh, will spend some time with you and listen anyway and, and uh, help you decide what your next step is going to be. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Well, to, to move us on here, I think we've had a very good discussion. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Uh, I would just mention that uh, Thursday, March 28th at 6.30 p.m. in this room is the budget hearing for the housing. Everybody get that? Thursday, March 28th. You said 6 p.m. we're doing though? 6.30. 6.30 p.m., the regular start time for a... Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll say more of that too. Go ahead, Alexis, did you have... I was just going to mention that um, today is not the drop dead date for approving these um, increases. We could, we could increase, make the increases next month or next meeting and still meet the licensing invoicing. So yeah. um, we would have to push it back a week, but that has happened in the past. So I just wanted to mention that that is an option in the future. I appreciate you mentioning that. I personally, I'm just going to say what I'm going to do. I, I don't see any reason not to vote for this tonight. I, I think that what this does is starts the process that we need to start. I think it gets us to the place where we're, we want to start to move. Um, we, we get, you know, the, this, this brings us to catch us up to where we need to go. I see this as a connected but separate issue from this, uh, the, the idea of actually adding inspectors to the department that has been presented by members of the public tonight. I think that that's a, a worthwhile discussion that we should continue. But um, as for what we're voting on tonight, you know, you've asked to be able to catch up because you're looking diligently at your budget, realizing that you're falling a little bit behind on the what you need for those inspection cycles or for the for the inspection fees and you're you're catching up. I think you're you and your department are doing your job in a very good way. So I think it's important that we um, we help you move that forward so that we can at least go in that direction. Uh, but I do very much look forward to continuing this broader discussion as we talk about the, the budget in, ahead. Um, and I say that with the same caveat that Mr. Jones said. And I'm going to say it every single time we start saying the word budget. We are, we are about to face one of the most challenging budgets that we've faced in a very long time. It's, it is just simply a difficult fact. And, and I, I don't know exactly all the things we're going to have to do and what we're going to have to look at. You as a staff are looking through that right now and you're going to bring, bring your, best, um, you know, your best possible solutions to us when we start the budget hearings. But we know it's going to be hard. Um, and, and I'm sort of gearing myself up to have it be a bit gut-wrenching because of the fact that we are sitting in such a difficult spot. Um, from an economic standpoint, things cost more money. From a legislative standpoint, the state of Iowa has capped our ability to be able to raise revenue. Not that we want to just start jacking up the fees and everything on everybody and jacking up property taxes like crazy just for the sake of doing it. We would never do that. We're going to do things based on the information that we have. We are going to potentially have to raise fees on things. We are going to potentially have to look at whatever property taxation we can because that's what it takes to run a city government in a way that is responsible. And it's what it takes to be able to provide the services that we're all talking about tonight. But it's going to be a really hard discussion. So I, I appreciate all the work that you're, that you're doing to make this um, uh, all possible. But um, for tonight, I, I know I'm going to vote for this. And I, I know we've had a great discussion on it. So I am going to ask us to, to move ahead with this vote. So Lexus, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you being here. So we have a motion on the table by Mr. Jones, second by Wethel, to receive and file and adopt this resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Nay. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. That motion passes six to one. Action item number two is progress update, 3000 Jackson Street, Dubuque Brewing and Malting Building. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and uh, view the presentation. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Maybe you're not quite off the hook yet, Alexis. Sorry about that. Didn't realize you were right next on the agenda there. <clears throat> Mike, did you have anything to start with or are we just going straight to Alexis? Thank you. Alexis Sayer, Housing Community Development Director. Um, so H&W tonight, actually everything is in your memo. Um, the 
asbestos work is underway. The asbestos work is much larger than originally anticipated. So originally the asbestos was uh, tested around the piping, which is very typical of uh, a building that age. And yes, it was positive, so they knew they had to remove the piping. When they were in starting that work, they um, identified the actual company for asbestos removal, identified that it is possible the mastic, which is what connects the clay layer on the inside, could also be asbestos. Um, they had that tested while they were taking the piping out, and it was did come back positive. Um, that is going to be um, very, very significant removal of material. And so they've started that removal, but they're going to be building a chute, um, a construction chute to the interior courtyard um, to then dispose of it into containers and then take it out to landfill for proper removal of the asbestos. Um, we're talking tons and tons of the material are coming out. Uh, from the exterior, it's not going to see, seem like a lot because it is the interior clay wall that is coming down with all of that mastic. They are working. Um, this week is the concentration on getting that chute set up with all of those um, containers to take it away. And then um, they, we got an update today that then the next week would be um, the working on the removal. So the chute takes a week to construct and then it'll be the removal. So hauling all of that out to the landfill. Once that is completed, they can start all of the construction, which you would see more on the exterior. You'll see construction workers today, but you're not gonna see them taking all that brick from the outside yet. And that's the update that we have. So daily, things are moving forward, which is what we are asking at this point. Yes, at this point, we actually have uh, requested that the owner contacts us daily with a daily update. Even though it's, hey, this whole week we're building a chute, he has to tell us every morning, hey, this whole week we're building the chute. So um, if he does not check in daily, then we go out at uh, 2 to 3 p.m. to make sure that the construction workers are still on site. They're still doing the work that they said they were going to do or a municipal infraction is being issued. As of today, no municipal infraction has been issued. The work is continuing. And I appreciate you letting us know that it's interior mostly, that there is things happening, but we can't necessarily see it all the time. That's right. very good. Mm -hmm. um, we ask a timeline most of the time. Do we have a sense? No. Um, the sense that we have is the next two weeks are all the asbestos. Um, once the asbestos is completed, it is likely they're going to need a crane and a lot of equipment to mobilize. That can take up to a week, if not longer, depending on how you can quickly get a crane. Um, we, to date, do not have the information on how they're going to do the demolition. So the demolition can be done in a lot of different ways, and they have not confirmed that it's the way we assume it would happen. So we are still waiting on that timeline. Uh, we also are just waiting for the demolition permit sign-offs, so all of the final demolition uh, required sign-offs from utilities. Gotcha. Thank you. Other questions? Um, so we've had this on the agenda every single council meeting. I think the community has appreciated hearing the updates that are, that are happening. Um, I, given the fact that we are seeing regular progress here, I would like to suggest and, and see what everybody thinks about this, of having it on the consent agenda going forward as a written update to say this is what's happening, um, unless there's something significant that we need to talk about and address. Um, and we can always pull it from the consent agenda if need be, but I would like to suggest that we put it there rather than an action item so it's still on the agenda, still getting updates, um, but may not require quite as much discussion in the future. Hopefully very little because it's moving fast and, and we're going where we need to go. I'm seeing heads shaking. Mr. Resnick. Yes, I, I like that idea. I have a quick question if you wouldn't mind. Please. Is there a financial reason uh, for them to get uh, move faster or to move slower? I mean, is there, um, because of course we would like them to move as quick as possible, but do, does their financial condition uh, change whether it go, because they go faster or slower? Um, you know, from what we've been told by the owner, there is, um, they're seeking a third party loan to, kind of, to cover the full demolition costs. That third party loan um, would need an assessment, a reassessment of the building value um, after demolition, and that does take time. So um, currently there is a little bit of an incentive for the owner to, to drag his feet. Um, that's why we're here to try to keep him 
you know, every day, you're gonna make progress because we're not, we're not waiting around for lots of processes that you could expedite if you really put some effort into it. So um, otherwise there's not, uh, the other financial incentive to move forward is a missile infraction every day. Um, that is the only disincentive on the other side to move faster is if you don't, there's a missed pump fraction. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, the mayor mentioned a, a schedule, and uh, maybe we could help with that schedule and put it down, uh, meet and consult, but, I mean, and then put a put a calendar on it. Right now, you said there, there really isn't one, and if it's going to come from someone who has a financial reason to make it go slower, and we really would like it to move faster, uh, maybe we need to adopt a schedule in consult, you know, in consultation with the owner. But do you think that would be helpful or, or just a lot of work? Um, we could base the municipal infractions upon the timeline then, um, but we are going to see construction delays, which is very typical. Um, and so we're going to have to evaluate if it's, a, if it's a real delay or if it's not, and construction is hard to do that with. Um, we are asking him for the timeline. We've asked him twice in the last week for just this, you know, Monday and Friday, um, for that timeline, and we have not received one. We've also asked for, he said he was going to provide the council some financial documentation on how he's going to fund. He does not provide to that either. Um, we could put deadlines on those things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ms. Wethel, go ahead. I think you bring up a great point, Mr. Resnick. Uh, one concern I have is that uh, we estimated about $75,000 of taxpayer money has been spent in closing the road, creating the barriers, and securing that area. And to me, um, we are continuing to need to, when it snows, plow around that area. And it's taking time and money from taxpayers to maintenance this problem at this point. And so I would be in favor in, of considering some sort of a fee schedule of um, expectations moving forward, uh, just so that everyone understands that we appreciate that the taxpayers have invested money already in this project. So thank you, Ms. Wethel. Um, I think this becomes complicated um, as, as you're describing. And, and I think that um, I'm, I really appreciate the work that you, Alexis and, and, and Mike um, Belmont are doing and, and the rest of the staff doing to try to, and, and obviously everybody else, public works and everybody who has to work around this. Um, I think you're probably best suited to take the ideas that have been presented here and, and come back to us in the next round to say what is possible, what is realistic as far as timelines go. I'd, I'd love to say get this done in two weeks, but the challenge is it's we need to be realistic about what's happening too. Um, we're seeing progress that's better than we've seen in a long time. But if there is a way that we can set some timelines, it sounds like there'd be agreement at this table to to be for that if, if you're able to. Um, I guess what I would say is let's, um, you know, this has been a, a helpful update. Let's put it on the consent agenda for the next time. I will openly say that I always reserve the right to move that before the agenda comes out, so I can always put it in the action items if we need to. Um, and if I, if I determine that with, with staff's help and with Mike's help, but um, at the same time, we can always pull it from the consent agenda to have further discussion for any council member, any member of the public can do that. So um, let's go with that for now. And if there is a way that we can help to move this timeline along faster, know that that is the desire that we and I think the rest of the community have. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Sprint, go ahead. Alexis, yes. when he gives you that demo schedule or, or plan, which we're still waiting for, are we going to notify the neighbors? Of the timeline? Yes. So um, they're aware? We currently have been um, updating neighbors that have contacted us uh, with concerns. So we have uh, a list of three that we contact that ask for regular updates. Um, if it were to affect the different closures, so there could be equipment up front instead of just on the side on 30th Street, could be on Jackson. Um, those are updates that we could provide as a letter. So we would provide that as, hey, you're not going to have access, and we would do that anyway on any project, but we for sure are going to do it on this one. 
is the owner going to, you know, because because he's going to bring in a crane. I, he's going to have to take this thing from the top down. Um, that crane's going to be sitting there maybe a month. I mean, I'm just, because this isn't going to, I'm just imagining the timeline that you're already kind of, okay, two weeks yet on the asbestos removal. Hopefully he gets us the crane information, but you still got to wait for the permits. Any idea how much longer on the demo permits or those? No idea. We have not heard from <clears throat> Zinzer or the owner on where they are on that permit. Okay. So we're still waiting on that. Okay. It's just, I feel like this is going to take uh, like six more months before this thing's down on the ground, but hopefully it doesn't take that long. My biggest concern is once he starts dismantling it, if he doesn't do this correctly, is this, it's just going to come down. It's not going to come down like, yeah. it's just going to be a tower of Jenga laying on the street, and I don't want that for anybody. So I, I understand that we need to get this going, that we all want to get this going. Trust me, we are all tired of looking at this thing. But I really want to have that, I want him to have a very, solid, firm demo plan. Because if this comes down wrong, I don't want to be on the news. Thank yeah. you. And I, and I do want to mention, when we look at reasonable list for progress, the, well, this week we're going to build a shoot is not the end of our review. So I don't want it to feel like, okay, that's good enough for us and that's all we're hearing. Um, we are double checking their on site because if they're not on site that day, there's a reason. And that doesn't mean you're expediting. That doesn't. That means you went somewhere else. You're on another site. Um, we're also checking on getting those timelines. So if this week we're not seeing that demolition permit, that's going to be not reasonable progress. So just those updates he's giving us aren't our only check for reasonability. So those are being placed in into our timeline. Is okay. This is how long it has taken for other demo permits. Is there a holdup? Is it Black Hills? We can make a call, and we will do those things as well. So I don't want it to make it. I probably didn't say that very well, but that isn't our only check, is the one check-in. We are having other points in which this should be in, so tell me why it's not, and then is that reasonable reason for it not being? Thank you. All right, thank you, Alexis. Appreciate the update. And I, I also wanna say thank you to Mr. Emerson for moving forward, continuing to make some level of progress. Um, we appreciate you working with us to do that, so thank you. Thanks. All right, motion here is to uh, receive and file. Hear that presentation. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number three is approval of Westbrook Park and Eagle Valley Park concept plans. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Sprank. Motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Leisure Services Director Marie Ware is recommending City Council approval of the Westbrook Park and Eagle Valley Park concept plans. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. And uh, Marie is under the weather tonight, so uh, Jared Charlin, the uh, um, project manager, project and facilities manager is here to address any questions anybody might have. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Questions, discussion, Mr. Mr. Jones. The only question that, that I had is, uh, I, I don't see in the any of the memos or history that uh, the Park and Recreation Commission has made a recommendation on this or signed off on it. Jared Charlin, Project and Facilities Manager for Leisure Services. Uh, yes, we did bring that to the Park and Rec Commission, and they did unanimously vote for it. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Frank. Um, Jared. A little confusion from my neighbors up at Eagle Valley. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a concept. This isn't actually what's going to, isn't, this isn't the actual, the drawings aren't the actual finalized project, what's going to be built, right? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, this is the initial concept. The final design will come later, but this is the idea that we want to bring. Okay. Will that idea come back to us and then citizens that submitted input, or are citizens still able to submit input, or is that? Uh, the final, we had two sessions of citizen input. One was for to gather final design, or excuse me, initial design input. And then after we did that, we brought back a second round of community engagement for Westbrook, English Ridge, and for Eagle Valley. And they, 
pick the specific, like the shape of the structure, the specific playground they wanted, things like that. And then after that, we brought it to you for a vote, and then that'll be their last input, except for English Ridge, which we did not bring to you tonight because we're having it revised. Okay, all right. Thank you. So clarity, clarity on that, just real quick, because that, that's a good question. So this vote that we take tonight basically says, yes, move forward with this concept plan. There might be some tweaks, or will there be big changes coming down the line? Um, Let me understand that a little more. It'd be, this is the, the idea of it, yes, you'll okay. be voting on. But there could be small tweaks for uh, supply chain issues or something like that. Got it. But in general, this is what the park is going to look like in both places? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Resnick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, I, I spoke um, in depth and often with one of the uh, citizens involved with the Westbrook uh, Park, and uh, it's been going on for a long time. And she is very happy with the work that uh, that she's. Every time she contacts the Leisure Services, she's very happy with working with our staff, which is great. And she understands why it might take this long, but they're ready. They're ready for a, a nice park, as promised in the in the agreement. And uh, so, last thing that she told me was uh, there was a community gathering. And they were all excited about where we were at this point, how it was looking. They really felt some ownership in uh, making this work, and they appreciated the city uh, go, coming through with this at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. So I have a question about um, trail connections, because we got a, a few emails from residents this week after this concept came in on this agenda. Um, and I understand, so for Westbrook, there's a chance to potentially connect it um, to the Chavanel Trail, for example. Um, for the Eagle, I'm sorry, for Eagle, Eagle Valley, the, there's a possibility of connecting it potentially to Shiras uh, Avenue. But d does the city actually own the land to make those connections? Is that land that belongs to the city of Dubuque? Uh, both plots are surrounded by public. So for Westbrook, for instance, we could connect it to Chavanel, but we'd have to either put a sidewalk in between Westbrook Drive and Chavanel Drive, except there's a bridge that's only two lanes, and it has no pedestrian uh, access on that bridge. So the bridge would have to be replaced and widened. Mm -hmm. And if engineering does that in the future, we would gladly partner with them and have that planned out. The other option for Westbrook would be to put a trail in through the detention basin on the east, southeast side. However, we run into private property, so we'd need an easement granted. And either one of those scenarios would need more funding as we used all the money we had on the developments that we have in the concept. Sure, and, and take me to the Eagle Valley one too. So the, to connect it to Shiras, is that all land that the city owns or is that private land as well? Uh, the city owns up through the detention basin. So we talked to engineering and we could make a kind of a nature trail, an unpaved trail, about with the same grade as the park development. It would get us to the other side of the basin. Once we hit there, we would go onto private property again. We would need another easement that would allow us a trail down to Shiras Avenue. Got it, okay. That's really helpful, I think, for everybody to understand, because, and, and for us too, because it's, it's not as easy as just, well, there's just a line right there. Let's just put a sidewalk or something to be able to do that. There, there's a lot that goes into something like that, especially when we run into private property. But the biggest thing is that trails are big ticket items. I mean, to be able to, to put a sidewalk on a bridge, that's no small task. I mean, that's, that's widening an entire bridge. So um, as much as we would like to do that, and I'd love to see trail connections in the same way. And, and I'm hoping that we continue to push in that way in, I would say, the decade ahead. Uh, that's a challenging prospect that uh, it always, I think we need to recognize, always does require some funding that comes along with it. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I appreciate citizen input, but I tell you what, that needs to go in front of the neighborhoods as far as I'm concerned, because uh, yes, it connects the, um, the trails for that neighborhood, but it also connects the park for everybody on the trail. And maybe that's not what they want, and that's not what we've agreed to in our development agreement. So I think before we just say, hey, let's do this and make a connection, I think it needs to start over again because, uh, you know, someone who's not in the neighborhood to make that suggestion and we move too early, I just think that's uh, not right. So uh, that's a possibility. I think it's intriguing, but I think a lot more uh, uh, citizen input needs to take place, my own personal opinion. Thank no, you, No, it's Mr. a good Mayor. point. It's a really good point. Thank you. Okay. Well, Jared, thanks for pinch hitting tonight. Really appreciate that.
All right, motion here is to receive and file and approve these concept plans. Uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number four is Dubuque Trees Forever Community Orchard Proposal for Caledonia Park. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file and enthusiastically approve. Second. second. Oh. Yeah, motion by Jones. <laughs> we and a second. Second, a second by Wethel. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Leisure Services Director Marie Ware is recommending City Council approval of the concept plan for Caledonia Park and allow staff to continue to work with Dubuque Trees Forever to create a community orchard and pollinator garden at that park. The Park and Recreation Commission unanimously approved the preliminary concept for use of the space for a community orchard. The plan will undergo further review, such as the city's design review process prior to a project moving forward. Dubuque Trees Forever would construct and maintain the space. The intent is to provide fresh grown food for the local neighborhoods and the community. The pollinator plants will also allow people of all ages to enjoy the birds, bees, and butterflies that are attracted to the plants. Laura Roussel, Executive Director of the Dubuque Trees Forever, shared the preliminary concept plan with the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission at their Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024 meeting. Roussel informed the commission that Dubuque Trees Forever plans to engage the neighborhoods for this project. Westminster Church, as well as students and teachers from the Alta Vista campus are also interested in the project. Boy Scouts might engage in Eagle Scout projects to help complete the proposed walkways. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Ms. Ms. Roussel, I'll let you go first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, as executive director of Dubuque Trees Forever, um, I will abstain from voting, but I did want to share a few comments. Um, we are really excited to for this opportunity to utilize a vacant lot for a productive neighborhood orchard to bring fresh fruit and beautiful trees and plants to the neighborhood and the whole community, to provide a cool place to go on a hot day, to provide a location for respite to enjoy and learn about nature with a pollinator garden, to provide an opportunity for community engagement in planting, care and maintenance of the site, and eventually distribution of fruit to neighbors, food pantries, and others. We have many groups and individuals already interested in being part of this new initiative with many more to be added. Dubuque Trees Forever is working with our experts and enthusiasts from our board and the community to, be, to build a planting and care plan for the site. We thank the city for this opportunity to serve our community and bring benefits of trees and pollinators to Dubuque. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roussel. Mr. Resnick. Thank you. And uh, there's some exciting possibilities here. Uh, a couple things. Um, first of all, there's no such thing as Caledonia Park on our, our map. It's called Bluffside Park. So I don't know if that's been changed or, or uh, what's going on, but I, I, it should be correct. Um, so I, and I appreciate that the neighbors are going to be contacted. Uh, have they... Uh, I hope that they're contacted earlier than when we say, well, it's going to happen. So, um, I mean, I have, I used to live in the neighborhood and I have seen people use that park, you know, people throwing the ball around and those kind of things. It's, it's on the hill, so it's, it's rarely used. Um, but I think uh, maybe some early talking to uh, residents would be good. Uh, the other thing is, uh, since it's city owned, or is it? It's going to be privately owned. Is that uh, this thirty five hundred dollars? Does that mean you're purchasing the the land? No. No, it would, the city would own. It would just be maintained. Yes. So okay, great. So city owned, and eventually with with the with this um, orchard, um, some of the areas that we have dense vegetation. Um, eventually, we need you know, a way to walk through. So there'll be, you know, improvements needed and maybe an emergency phone uh, for these uh, areas. And maybe you'd, we don't anticipate that, um, but I'm just, uh, as Ms. Russell was talking about, uh, they're going to maintain it. Does that mean upgrade it to certain things like electoral, electrical and, and sidewalks and those kind of things? Uh, or is it just going to be a... a, a green area and uh, 
It's going to be open enough that we feel that there's no safety risk to the neighbors. So those are some of my concerns. I don't know if we have uh, answers for those, uh, but uh, I would I would love to hear it. Right now, it's unused, but it's green space, and it looks kind of pretty right there. You know, the nice patch of green, um, and uh, I know the fruit trees are can be pretty as well. So anyway, those are my concerns, and I'd love to hear any kind of a reply from anyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If you um, happen to look at the attachments, um, Mr. Resnick, there is a concept plan there. Of course, that will be um, go through the review process, but it'll include, include a sidewalk and, and things like the emergency phone and, and, and items to um, be considered. We're gonna have a public meeting on February 21st at 6.30 to bring out all of those concerns as we develop our plan so that we have those in mind as we move forward. Thank you for that input. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Very Scott. briefly, and I did see the, the map and I see the trees and uh, lovely colors, and I see the black around. I didn't see that that was um, sidewalk. It, is it labeled in there somewhere? Uh, or it just looked like a path or something. But anyway, and then there's a po possible plantings in the middle, which are nice. It's going to be hard, hard to walk around a little bit, isn't it, because of the, uh, the steepness of that area. So um, I think there's a lot of good possibilities here. Uh, and are we able to, if there's objection in the neighborhood, um, is that going to be a, an issue with this? Um, or should we just move ahead tonight and uh, hope for none. I, 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 again, thank you for the answers I'm getting. I, I think just real quick, I think we're, so we're approving the general concept plan um, and to allow staff to continue to work with the Dubuque Trees Forever to create a community orchard and pollinator garden at the park. So I think in general, that's what we are approving, is to clarify that piece of it. Um, Ms. Weffel. May I just ask, uh, the February 21st, 6.30 p.m. meeting, is that run by Trees Forever? And where will that be? It's going to be at the I'm On Arena. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yeah, Mr. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Jones. Yeah, you I, first. I just say I, I don't have any qualms in voting for this at all. Um, this was really published uh, better than, than most things that happen at the city council table, along with the required publications that, that the city did. But there was an excellent uh, story on the concept and the plans in the, in the Telegraph Herald, and I appreciate that. Um, and I don't know if other council members have heard objections from neighbors, but I certainly haven't. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Redmond? Are, are we going to do the 200 feet? Uh, Notice to to um, to residents. That's a, I guess my question. We have a we usually if there's a change in the neighborhood, we uh, residents who live within 200 feet of that in, uh, change will be notified. Uh, so I'm just wondering. I mean, I'm I'm comfortable uh, approving this tonight because I think it's going to move forward and there won't be uh, a problem. But moving, you know. Uh, a meeting at Imon is a little bit different than, you know, uh, 200, you know, everyone get a personal letter from, you know, who lives 200 feet from it. Uh, I don't know what kind of engagement that we're going to have neighbors going all the way out onto uh, Schmidt Island for this. But um, I, d I do, w I would like the public to be notified. I don't think that's controversial uh, and asked about the situation. So I'm hoping that we will, um, I, I plan to say yes to this tonight, uh, but I'm just hoping that part of the plans is that we will uh, talk to the neighbors who live within 200 feet. I think they'll be enthusiastic, but we should ask. Thank you. I'd say thank, uh, thank you very much for that input. That's the kind of information we'll be looking for on February 21st. And we'll also be working with our neighborhood associations as well. Any other comments, questions? Okay. 
Well, I'm excited to vote for this too. Um, as um, a member of one of the neighborhood associations that borders this particular park, I'm very excited to see this space um, transformed in a way that could really benefit the, the neighborhood and the community. Okay, we have a motion by Jones, second by Wethel to receive and file and approve this uh, concept plan. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, with uh, allowing the staff to continue to work with Dubuque Trees Forever to create a community orchard and pollinator garden in this park. So Adrian, would you call the roll please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Just to clarify, it was um, six zero. It was a, a abstention, abstention from Roussel. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah, I thought my math was a little wrong there when I said it out loud. So thank you very much. With one abstention, so pass six zero with one abstention. Action item number five is Dubuque Police Department 2024 Awards and Recognition Program. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Jones, I move to receive and file and um, see the presentation. Second, second by Sprank. Got a motion by Jones. Second by Sprank. Um, Am I going straight to you? Okay. All right. Uh, Mayor, Council, and City Staff, my name is Brendan Walsh. I'm a captain with the Police Department. And I was asked to do kind of a quick review of what our awards and recognition program is, some history on it, as well as a recap of our event, which was just about uh, 10 days ago. Um, so um, it's been mentioned, I think, last year we talked about how late Chief Dalsing recognized the need for formalizing a program where we can recognize officers um, and celebrate their achievements throughout the year. And in 2011, Chief Dalsing, um, at his direction, uh, formed a committee of officers that would uh, that is still together today. Um, at that time in 2010, to, to look at what other agencies were doing and to try to find a system by we can have a formal um, awards and recognition program. <clears throat> that was in 2011. Over the course of the next two years, the committee conducted research and policy development, looking at what other agencies were doing, um, looking at vendors for buying awards and, and come, uh, essentially coming up with a system. Our first wave of awards were issued that year in 2015, um, and the awards process was pretty straightforward at that time. Essentially, any department employee, civilian staff, or sworn officers could nominate a fellow uh, employee um, for an award that had different criteria met. And included in your uh, memo today is kind of an outline of what our policy looks like now and what awards we actually have, as, as well as the definition, the behaviors or actions that would, would classify somebody being nominated or being uh, selected for that award. Um, so that was kind of our process between uh, 2012 and 2015. Um, the process then was if I recognized an officer doing something great and it fit and I thought this criteria, I would submit it to the committee. The four officers in that committee would vote. If we needed a tiebreaker, it would be um, the chief at the time. And uh, from there, uh, the system only involved really us giving the award then to the employee's supervisor. And at some point, the, that a supervisor would either sit down with them and say, hey, great work on this call, or um, maybe call up a few of, of that officer's peers and present it to them. But there really wasn't a consistent method for how we did that. Um, Included in your information tonight um, is the actual current awards and recognition policy, which actually it's had a, a couple um, revisions over the years. Uh, the actual awards and the definition of actions needed per each defined award. Um, you can revide, uh, review the actual design um, of the award bars and the ribbons that the officers are awarded if they're selected or if the committee approves that. Our vendor is Davis Stanton, um, which provides um, really high quality brass um, awards and award backers for that. Um, and then going to 2020, the committee, um, now with new membership and with en encouragement from Chief, Chief Dulsing, um, began work on formalizing the actual, actual process of having an awards night or an awards ceremony. And that's where we are at now uh, with year three, um, just wrapping up uh, last, um, last Thursday or we could go last Thursday. Um, if you look at the program that's included in your memo as well, you may also notice that our awards night is not strictly about recognizing the formal awards for those officers, but we also um, that night want to recognize all other milestones, promotions, anniversaries, retirements from the past year. We also recognize usually each year a citizen or a group of citizens that have been really helpful or beneficial um, in some way for the, the police department. And again, without taking up too much of your time, that program as well as the policy are included in your memo tonight. And so for three years now, we've been keeping with this format. It's gone over really well. Um, we've received positive feedback from the officers that are involved, but also um, overwhelmingly by family members that are attending. Oftentimes officers are not relaying what they do to their family members. They're modest or they just don't talk about work at home a whole lot. And so many times we have family members that are attending these saying, holy cow, I didn't realize what y'all were doing or how impactful my loved one, my husband or wife 
was with that family or in that circumstance. So um, briefly uh, looking at the awards um, program from the other night, you can see the different types of awards. Obviously, we won't go through them all. Um, but they uh, similar to a military structure. You have the higher level awards, which come with um, um, bravery or gallantry, um, all the way down to if an officer is injured on duty. Um, moving down the list, we have Certificate of Merit, for example, which has been awarded over 45 times in the last eight years for um, simple acts of an officer going above and beyond and doing something well. So um, looking at what we did, um, essentially, uh, who we recognized this year. Um, Distinguished Service Medal, Medal, which is one of our higher um, awards, was awarded twice this year. It's only been awarded five times in the past. Don Dempsey, who was a longtime front office employee, um, a rock at the police department, over 40 some years working there, um, was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, as was Corporal Brian Woolweber, who's been a canine officer for over 15 years and has been um, very instrumental in um, adapting and building our canine program. They both re received the uh, Distinguished Service Medal and the definition of the criteria uh, that uh, their actions needed to meet is included in that packet as well. Um, we had seven officers receive the Certificate of Merit, which again, that's been awarded about 45 times in the last eight years. But those are officers that by definition are demonstrating personal initiative and going above and beyond what's expected of their normal duties um, through the course of the year. And then also impressing, we had um, five officers that received the Life Saving Award, and that simply is them doing something throughout the year that saved the citizen's life. That's been awarded uh, 20 times in the last eight years that we've been doing this awards program. So again, I appreciate your time. We just wanna make you aware of what our program is, if you're not familiar with it, uh, as well as what our officers are doing each year and, and how we're recognizing them. So if you have any questions, be happy to answer them. All right, well, thank you, Captain Wells. Any comments? Okay, thank you. Well, hang, hang on, I, I oh. got something for you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> don't you go anywhere too fast. Okay. No, I, I just, I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure I say thank you for, for, doing, for doing this every single year. You know, I, I, something you said really stuck with me. It's the fact that um, there are family members mm -hmm at this award ceremony, they don't even realize what their loved one is doing on a daily basis and the impact that they really make for everybody in the city of Dubuque. Um, you know, I think we, we talk about the work you do a lot here. And, um, and I, I think that we, I, I, the impression I get is that we as a council absolutely see the impact that you make in the city, but even we don't see every single little thing that you do. So the fact that you have this award ceremony that uh, allows us to, to get a little bit more of a peek into what is actually happening on a daily basis um, for you and your officers is really, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's a privilege for us to be able to see that. So thank you very much for yeah. sharing that with your department, sharing it with us and sharing it with the entire city. I appreciate it. Yeah, Ms. Weppel, go ahead. I was able to join you and I appreciate that opportunity. Um, I was blown away by hearing about the individual stories of those who received um, awards and it just fell really uh, strongly upon me um, to watch their family members get to watch them receive those awards. It was, it was wonderful. Um, one thing you didn't mention, but I thought was really powerful, uh, your relationship with Dr. Nicole Keedy. She was a guest speaker for the evening, and she spoke not just to our officers, but spoke to their families about um, emotional intelligence, support of your partner, um, both at home and at work, and how to look out for one another, and the fact that our police department thinks this way, I'm so proud of. So. Thank you for having her that night, but thank you, I know, for working with her all the time and, and many colleagues like her in our community. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Captain that, Chief, for being here tonight. You really appreciate it. Appreciate your support. All right. Well, motion here is to receive and file. See that presentation. Aiden, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number six is agenda and meeting management system request for proposals. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Roussel. I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Farber. Motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Adrian. Yes, thank you. Adrian Breitfelder, city clerk. So the requested RFP before council is for an agenda and meeting management system to replace the system that we currently use. Um, the city has used Novus Agenda to digitally manage and publish city council agenda since 2011. 
Novus Agenda was acquired by a company called Granicus in 2017, and the company has been forthcoming in sharing that Novus Agenda is not considered part of their long-term portfolio. Um, so based on this, city staff were aware that Novus Agenda would be discontinued um, eventually um, at some point in time. And this was communicated to the city council during the city clerk's office fiscal year 2024 budget presentation as part of an improvement package for a replacement um, system. Granicus recently announced um, an official timeline to discontinue Novus Agenda, which they have split into two separate events. The first event they defined as end of support, and that is where they will cease to provide additional minor updates or enhancements. They say that critical bug fixes and security updates will continue through to the end of life date. The end of support date is um, targeted for October 31st of 2024. And then the second event they defined as end of life, which is where they will cease to provide basically all support for Novus Agenda, including critical bug fixes and security updates. And they have defined that date as September 30th of 2025. So the purpose of this RFP is to identify a replacement agenda and meeting management system. Um, the goal is for it to continue to uh, have many of the same functionalities as the current system. Um, my memo specifies the members of the RFP committee, which represent a variety of departments that are involved in the system. And I will just highlight that the mayor has been asked to serve on the RFP committee to represent the city council. The goal is to present a recommended vendor to the council in June. Um, implementation of a new system, including a formal transition date to a new system, will be dependent upon the vendor schedule. So that's just a high level summary, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you to you and your office for all your work on this. It's very, very, very thorough. The as the RFP as well. I mean, I appreciate uh, being able to to see where we're going with this as we start this process, especially since it sort of feels like I'm going to be losing a member of my family. I mean, I spend as, about as much time with Novus <laughs> Agenda as I do with my family. So, all right. Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you, Adrian. Motion here is to receive and file and approve. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Action item number seven is recreation fee increase recommendation and estimated revenue summary. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? Move to receive and file and approve. Second? Motion by Jones, second by Resnick. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Leisure Services Director Marie Ware is recommending City Council approval of the recreation fee increases starting spring of 2024 to assist in offsetting the impact of recent wage increases and other operational cost increases. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval and uh, Leisure Services Director Marie Ware is feeling under the weather so Recreation Division Manager Dan Kroger is here to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Do we have questions? Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't have any questions, but this is one of those times, again, like, like earlier this evening, you know, I don't want to spend any more money than we have to, but, I mean, we have to pay our bills, and we have to, we have to get good people to serve our citizens. We've got, you know, great citizens, and they deserve the best employees they could uh, they can get. And, you know, they have been, uh, in the past, really great, and we want to maintain that. So I, I guess I don't have an issue with just uh, paying our bills. We need to do this. Uh, so I, I would like to move ahead and make sure that we maintain these great things we've got going for our Dubuque citizens. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Purcell. Yeah. Oh, I, um, I was, I noted in the memo that our, our pool admissions are much below many of our comparable cities, and even with these proposed increases, we're still very competitive. And as Mr. Uh, Resnick noted, we need to have quality staff and in the quantities to make our facilities safe and to pay them appropriately. And even with these increases, I think we can still be competitive with our with other area communities. And um, we do have the programs that allow our income qualifying families to have those same opportunities 
but, but at reduced or free services. So I think that's really important to keep in mind that we offer that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that we're we're looking at this and um, taking this step. I, you know, it's it is always tough to to make decisions like this, but at the same time, as you pointed out, Ms. Russell, it's a it it absolutely is is very much in line with what other cities are doing at this point. And I also think, you know, not that this was surprising to any of us, but it was very very clear um, during the pandemic and then shortly thereafter how important these services are to people. I mean, when we couldn't open a pool because we were having some staffing challenges that many, many other places were having. That was a huge deal for people in the, in the community. And um, the Leisure Services Department and the Parks Department stepped up. And I really appreciate that. And our Recreation Department, I should say, really stepped up to be able to um, uh, you know, answer that call and make sure that we're, we're getting the staffing that we need. Um, did an incredible job last year in recruiting, um, doing another incredible job this year. So I, I think the fact that we're uh, basically agreeing to fund the things that we kind of already agreed to move forward with as we were um, looking at this within the last couple of years, I think is a good move. I think it's a smart one right now. Ms. Barbara. And just to add on to that, Mr. Mayor, the fact that the city is already promoting um, and advertising for support staff for the summer, I think is a great next step. And I think we're well on our way. And I think this is just another boost uh, to help make sure that we can offer uh, the recreational amenities this summer. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, motion here is to receive and file and approve. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. And as a reminder, action item number eight is removed from the meeting, so we will move on to action item number nine, which is request to Dubuque Metropolitan Area Transportation Study to reprogram federal surface transportation block grant funds. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. I motion that we receive and file and approve. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Sprank and a second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Our region has been presented two exciting opportunities to advance two important transportation projects, an overpass over the railroad tracks at 14th Street and major improvements to the intersection of the Northwest Arterial and Highway 20. To leverage federal and state funding for these two projects, local funding needs to be identified. In April 2022, the Mayor and City Council approved submitting an application to the U.S. Department of Transportation for the Rebuilding America's Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity, or RAISE, Infrastructure Planning Grant to assist with the planning and design of a multimodal transportation corridor project for proposed improvements to the Elm Street Corridor, the 16th Street Corridor, the Kerper Boulevard Corridor, the Chaplin Schmidt Island Corridor, and the proposed 14th Street Railroad Overpass Bridge Project. The city grant application was approved, and in November 2023, a grant agreement negotiated with the following budget. The city received uh, $2,280,000 from the raised planning grant from the federal government and that was 52.1% of the planning project. Uh, local funds uh, came from the city of $1,350,000 and the Dubuque Racing Association, or DRA, for $750,000 for the remaining funding of the uh, total project cost of $4,380,000. Planning and design has progressed enough that the city is ready to apply for a raise grant for construction of some of the elements. The raise grant application for the 14th Street overpass and related improvements is due at the end of February. The raise grant project covers several city council priorities, including the raise grant and matching funds for construction was one of the council priorities, the Central Avenue corridor revitalization plan by connecting Central Avenue to traffic from Wisconsin the Riverfront Bike Trails, the Kerper Boulevard Industrial Park, mm. and the reinvestment plans for Schmidt Island. This project also meets the City Council priority of leveraging federal and state infrastructure grant programs and street maintenance and rehabilitation program, thereby directly addressing four of the 10 City Council priorities. The impending increase in train traffic due to the merger of the Canadian Pacific 
and Kansas City Southern Railroads will negatively impact our region. The merger is projected to double the number of trains passing daily through the metropolitan area from nine trains to 18 by 2027. This surge in train activity will lead to significant delays at rail crossings and will hinder the efficient movement of people and goods, significantly impacting vulnerable neighborhoods and key employment centers. The total project costs are estimated at $54,780,000. The maximum raise grant for construction is $25 million. The city needs to prioritize the project elements, putting some elements into future phases and identify additional funding sources. The city needs to request reallocation of DMATS STBG funds for the February 8th DMATS agenda. So that's this coming Thursday. ECIA interim executive director Chandra Avada has identified $11,252,825 of DMATS STBG funds that could be reprogrammed from the East-West Corridor Project, the Cedar Cross Road Project, and an amount in fiscal year 2028 not yet programmed that could be used to help make the 14th Street overpass and needed improvements at the Northwest Arterial Highway 20 intersection happen. It is also anticipated that when a new federal transportation bill passes DMATS can expect $2.4 million of STBG funds in fiscal year 2029 based on past history. Planning and preliminary design has progressed on the East-West Corridor study, but along the way there have been two federal and state rule changes for use of federal and state transportation funds that have created an obstacle to quick completion of this project. The latest rule change says that the DMATS STBG funds can only be used for construction. So the city has to identify local funding or grants to complete final design and conduct property acquisition. Also, DMATS STBG funds can only pay for 80% of the construction costs. So the city must identify local funding or grants to pay 20% of the construction costs. The city cannot leave the existing DMATS STBG funding allocation to just wait for these additional funding sources to be identified. It would be reasonable that the $1,597,000 in DMATS STBG funds Chandra Avada has identified in fiscal year 2028, $500,000 of the money in the East-West Corridor project budget an anticipated $2.4 million that will be coming in fiscal year 29 from a future federal transportation bill, and the potential for $1 million in grants, such as the Iowa Clean Air Attainment and the Iowa Department of Transportation Traffic Safety Improvement Program, for a total of $5.5 million that will need to go to the intersection improvements at the Northwest Arterial and Highway 20 to leverage this $17.5 million of IDOT intersection improvement project that is expected to be built in 2028 through 2030, if it is included in the next IDOT five-year construction plan as requested by IDOT District 6. So the East-West Corridor project can continue to progress. There is still $847,467 in IDOT swap funds to complete preliminary design and environmental review, plus $1,065,920 in city funds to support that effort of the East-West Corridor project. As for the raised grant project, so that's the 14th Street uh, Railroad overpass and, uh, and associated improvements, as for the raise grant project, that leaves $9,155,825 in reprogrammed dollars from Cedar Cross, $3,286,000, and the East-West Corridor, $5,869,825 to reduce the funding shortfall. In addition, the city has $1,121,693 budgeted in 30% sales tax money for Cedar Cross Road. We have some belief based on their past comments that we can ask the Canadian Pacific for 5% of the 
of the 14th Street overpass construction cost, or $1 million. There is the $36,277,518 available for the raised project. The raised project has been broken down into 13 separate elements with 10 elements needed, and actually I apologize, it's 15 separate elements, with 10 elements needing to be delayed to future phases, and, and actually that would be, uh, uh, okay, and that's, that is correct still, uh, and five elements considered for inclusion in a raised construction grant application that will be coming to you for consideration at your February 19th City Council meeting. These, and actually it's five elements now, not three, are as follows. The 14th Street Railroad overpass, including utility relocations and property acquisitions, roundabout at the intersection of 16th Street and Sycamore Street, bridge modifications to 16th Street bridge over the Piasta Channel, and then the other two are uh, complete streets from the Five Points intersection to the intermodal facility on Elm Street, and complete streets from Elm Street to uh, uh, Admiral Sheehy Drive on uh, Kerper Boulevard. This would be a great project for Dubuque, the residents and businesses in the low-income census tracts, redevelopment efforts at the old PAC site, Schmidt Island redevelopment, the Central Avenue corridor, and so much more. I respectfully recommend Mayor and City Council approval to request reallocation of DMATS STBG funds. Thank you, Mike. Discussion, questions? Mr. Sprank. I am in full support of this. I mean, this is, I would like to call it a shot in the arm to what that neighborhood needs. Um, it makes our, this, it makes that entryway more welcoming, um, more inviting, so I am, full support on this motion, so thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Barber. So I also want to give some support and also applaud the very creative efforts um, and the full support of ECIA in coming up with all of the elements, uh, as Mike had described, because I know that took a lot of um, hard work to determine how we could get funding and how we could get support and then how that gears us up for the next um, iteration of the raise grant. So thank you very much for that creativity and I look forward to the next steps as well. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I'll echo everything said so far and add that uh, this railroad overpass is a bigger deal than, than most people sitting in their living rooms tonight can imagine. Um, the potential for unlocking half of Dubuque from the other half of Dubuque is enormous and the need is about to exponentially explode. Um, 18 freight trains passing through here a day. Has traveled the western states recently, and, and freight trains ain't what they used to be. They're long. They're really, really long, miles long. And if we're talking 18 mile long trains cutting our city in half every single day, um, this is a game changer. This, this uh, makes that less of a problem, less of a public safety issue, less of a being on time, getting places issue, uh, less of a being disconnected from the heart of the community issue for folks. So, and, and what, a, what a game of shuffleboard to line up the dots to make it even possible. So I see Terry smiling in the back. I know she played. Um, <laughs> Mike and the engineering team, I know that they played. Um, and it's, it's too bad to have to delay other long awaited projects, but this job's all about prioritization, and this is a, our highest priority in transportation right now. We haven't had one since the Northwest Air Trio got built, um, but this is clearly my highest priority in transportation systems for Dubuque right now, and I'm, I'm happy to see a, a path forward. I hope we can pull it all together. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Weather, did I see your hand? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I'll come back to you, Mr. Rosie. I hope our citizens understand that the piecing together of all of these parts is done by people who are so high caliber that work for our city and do such a service to her people. And I just wanna thank everybody because this is, this is a heavy lift of work and creativity and knowing how to get it done. Um, I wanna uh, echo Mr. Jones's statements about safety. 
this truly is about safety for one of our most vulnerable populations of our community. And it is the right step forward to do and the right investment for us. So thanks to everybody. Thank you, Ms. Wethel. Mr. Resnick. Thank you. I would like to say al along with this that uh, a legacy carrier at the airport would be nice as well as far as transfer <laughs> transportation. But I, I just want to tell the citizens, every year the city council um, uh, we evaluate the city manager and his staff, and a couple things that just shine tonight. Uh, talk about being nimble, and you can see how they got this information, and we're moving on it. And then long-range planning, how we've got things out there. He had things that planned out for years. So the idea that he and his staff jump on this, identify a plan, and then how to make it work. It all just in that brief memo. So I would like to, again, like others, thank the city manager and his staff to, for doing such great work looking out for the citizens. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Well, we've heard a lot of good words to describe this, innovative, creative. I'm going to add teamwork to that because I, you know, I hear ECIA jumping in, part of DMATS, you know, which we're all a part of, but uh, being able to work together, the, the fact that we work so closely together with all of our um, different community organizations to find innovative ideas like this is a really important one. Um, you know, I, Mike and Terry and everybody, Corey, you too, everybody who's, who's involved with this, I know you're eating, sleeping, and breathing this raise grant right now. I mean, this is a, this is a big deal in the next couple of weeks. This is uh, something that we have uh, obviously prioritized as a city council, and I think for very good reason. Uh, all the reasons that were already pointed out here. It's, it's a really important project. Um, you mentioned a couple of other important projects, and I want to make it really clear that, you know, um, the projects that are delayed were already delayed. Uh, this was not entirely just the city of Dubuque saying we're going to stop doing this and start working on something else. These are delayed for other reasons. They're delayed because changes in state rules and regulations and ways we're going to make things happen, um, changes in the way the federal government is working. Um, it's been frustrating, and I, and I want to make sure that, um, you know, I mean, for me personally, I'm not forgetting that point because things like the East-West Corridor and the Cedar Cross Project are important ones. And, and I know that... Um, they're important for, for different reasons than the project that we're currently funding in the way that we're funding. But it is something that I want to make sure we continue to press on in the years ahead uh, because we're going to need to find some creative ways to get that done as well. But considering the fact that we're finding this and we continue to find creative ways, I'm confident that we can do that. So I, I appreciate all the work that's being done. Mike. Yeah, I, I would like to say thank you for all the nice comments. Um, but I reflecting on, I didn't do a very good job in that memo talking about the teamwork part, and I wish I had. Um, you'll see that two of the CCs on the memo are Alex Dixon from the DRA, the president and CEO, and uh, Rick Dickinson, the president and CEO of the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. So they've been instrumental in helping make this, move this along. And as you'll remember in the memo, the DRA provided $750,000 match for us to even get the first planning grant, but also has been very involved in the whole process of design and, and review. And the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation has been also very involved. And in fact, they are uh, leading the effort to make sure that businesses in the area are very aware of what's happening, why it's happening, and uh, quite frankly, soliciting uh, support from businesses who are uh, enthusiastic about the project and then, of course, some that will be impacted by the project. We just don't know exactly because the, the final design isn't complete, so we don't know exactly who in, uh, is going to be uh, impacted, but there will be impacted businesses. And then, of course, uh, the federal government, who's the one who's going to provide most of the money for this, assuming we get the grant. In fact, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg came to Dubuque last year and Mayor Kavanaugh gave him a tour of the project, and I believe he was very impressed with that tour, and uh, hopefully that'll reflect in uh, the response we get once we submit the application. And then, of course, you mentioned uh, DMATS and ECIA and Chandra's great work, so thank you. Thanks for adding that, Mike. Yeah, it is. I mean, this is how Dubuque has gotten things done for years and years and years, as we find these innovative ways of doing it. So, um, fingers crossed, but, Feeling good about our efforts so far, so I'm definitely uh, looking forward to this grant going in. All right, we have a motion to receive and file and approve. So Adrian, would you call the roll please? 
Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Action item number 10 is work session request, Chaplain Schmidt Island Redevelopment Plan. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and set the work session for February 12th at 6 p.m. Second by Sprank. A motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. All right, landed on our calendars very recently, so I think we're all ready to go. All right, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 11 is work session request city prevention and response to an active aggressor situation. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move the city council schedule a work session to address the Topic of uh, aggressive emergency response for Monday, April 15th, 2024 at 515 in these chambers. Second by Wethel. Got a motion by Jones, second by Wethel. All right, Adrian, just call the roll, please. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Action item number 12 is work session request Iowa Jobs for America's Graduate City Life Student Presentation to City Council. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and set the work session for Monday, May 6th at 6 p.m. Second. Okay. Motion by Roussel, second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 13 is curbside collections battling the elements video. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file and view the video. Second. Got a motion by Farber, second by Wethel. You can watch the video and remind us all what snow looks like. Eric, <laughs> go for it. We definitely collect in all weather, whether it be a raining and it's 42 degrees or a thunderstorm, snowing, blizzard, ice, no matter what gets picked up, so we, uh, we work through it all. Working in all those conditions, you know, when it's 42 degrees in rain, you're, you get wet, you're cold. Uh, with the snow or blizzards, you're dealing with, you know, the snow, the different types of terrain, hills. I mean, right now, I mean, we got three foot high, uh, you know, snow banks here along people's curbs right now, so. I'm in the automated truck, so I'm not getting out nearly as much as the other guys, but having to get out at each stop and, you know, drag the tipper cart, I've been there, done that, and uh, it's definitely not easy. It's, it's tiring. I mean, even after an hour of just dragging the carts through the snow, you're, it takes a toll on your body and it, it wears you down and, you know, you still got another 700 stops to go for the rest of the day, so. Some of the areas people could put their cart to make it a little easier on us would be uh, not putting them behind the snow banks. Maybe shovel out a nice little area or even just on the corner of their driveway, nice little cut out there would greatly help all of us. We try our best to get everyone collected and if we don't, we, you know, we might have to come back tomorrow or work a Saturday, but we'll get everyone done. Thanks very much again to uh, our public information office for producing that another great video that shows us exactly what it takes to run a city our size. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the men and women who do that work on those days at, that, that show up at our house and on our street to get those things done. I mean, I think we have an absolutely incredible team, going back to the teamwork theme that we just discussed. So thank you very much for, for another great video. All right. Motion there is to receive and file and watch that. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next are council member reports. Reports. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Frank raised his hand first, so I'm coming back to you after that. No worries. Go for it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, earlier this month, I was able to go down with uh, some of our citizens that are battling at the state capitol with. Um, basically trying to advocate for the Table Mound group um, with the mobile home parks. I gave out our lovely talking points that we have in our legislative agenda. 
to some elected members at our state level. Hopefully, it de it helps. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that report, Mr. Jones. Stu and I are just back from uh, a six-state driving tour, mostly along uh, old Route 66. Um, and we saw about a dozen cities, I think, that we paid attention to anyway. And the places that it snowed, there was a lot more snow in the way of trying to drive and be than there are in Dubuque, Iowa. And the places where it didn't snow, there's a lot more other stuff laying around, like uh, I won't name the state, New Mexico, that if your tire blew up 25 years ago, chances are the remnants of it are still on the shoulder. <laughs> oh, um, no. But this city, leaving it and returning to it, is so incredibly clean compared to all 12 of the other ones. The other ones were not unattractive. They just weren't Dubuque, and they weren't uh, as well kept. Um, so the things that we're doing matter. Um, things that IDOT is doing alongside the highways matter, because um, I've seen them every day picking up chunks of tire and things like that that happen on the highway. And I didn't see that in all the places that we visited. So it's, it's good to be home. It's good to see other places. And some of them were pretty neat places, but they, they were no debut. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Farber. So speaking of teamwork, I wanted to give a shout out again to the um, Golden Ju Jubilee celebration at Dubuque Senior High. And we had over 100 um, former female student athletes attend the event. Uh, we filled the bleacher, and uh, we had a great mid mid court, mid time, in between games presentation. So it was just really great to, um, especially for the the um, basketball team and the coach was still with us, Ms. Larry Krogan. Uh, we were able to celebrate the exact 50 years of that program being established. Uh, so that was just great fun. Um, on another teamwork uh, point is for the National League of Cities, I am very honored to have been reappointed to the Information Technology and Committee, uh, the Advocacy Committee for them, and then also for an advisory committee, I was just appointed to the Artificial Intelligence um, Advisory Committee, also for the National League of Cities. So I'm very, uh, very honored to represent Dubuque. Uh, in these upcoming committee meetings. We've already had one for the ITC, and the AI will be um, starting with the National League of Cities meeting that we'll have in March. Um, and then another teamwork experience was with the Alternative Learning Center. And following, I think, previously that a couple of you had actually been to the school, they actually came to Magoo's, the class, and we talked about, and it was just a lot of fun, we talked about entrepreneurship, and we talked about workforce skills and talents and what it's like uh, to get yourself ready for a job once you graduate, depending upon what it is you want. And we could talk about all different kinds of positions. Um, so it was really fun to have about 12 of those students um, sit with us for a couple of hours. And I hopefully none of them had been to Magoo's before. So it was really a nice experience for them to see a small business operation. So that was a lot of fun. And then finally, it was just a pleasure to go to the warehouse ribbon cutting for Simmons uh, once again. So that was the second ribbon cutting I had attended for them uh, to see their expansion, their commitment to Dubuque, and then all of the trade and all of the people that were employed to get that established. It was really, as you were there as well, um, just really a great statement for the extended teamwork of all the different people in Dubuque to get this operational in a very short period of time. So. Thank you, Ms. Farmer. Thank Ms. you. Wethel. I just wanted to speak again about the experience of um, attending the police awards and recognition. Um, Mr. Van Milligan was there, and I was asked to stand up front and shake hands as the gentlemen and women came down and uh, after they received their award. And I will tell you, I felt like I shouldn't be in that position. I felt um, it was strange because I get to serve the city in this way, but they serve in, in such a way that is, um, yeah, it's impressive. And to see them there with children, um, I've already volunteered my daughters to um, babysit next year uh, for the <laughs> event, but um, they, they were there to support one another. It was, it was wonderful. And yes, the, the Simmons ribbon cutting, um, I'm very grateful to their company for providing my constituents, my patients, um, a quality work that um, 
the dignity of work, the excellent benefits and pay that they have offered to those in our community to grow our workforce and, and create a home for people where they feel that they are appreciated by an employer. Um, that was really impressed upon me by the presence of the staff that came in from Simmons uh, headquarters. So yeah, and you did a great job with your remarks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Bethel. Just a couple things for me. Um, since we were last together, I did attend the January annual meeting that is held in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, and speaking of the RAISE grant, made sure I remind everybody every time that I'm there that we'll be applying for that RAISE grant. Um, but you know, it was interesting. This was an interesting trip. I, I found myself um, not able to attend as many of the, the breakout sessions that, there, that are often had because I had uh, quite a few meetings set up with the help of our um, Director of Strategic Partnerships, Terry Goodman, and um, you know, I, I and able to reach out with some other groups that I that I that we interact with. Um, I'm always able to, when, when we're in Washington, anytime any of us is in Washington, to try to see our entire congressional delegation. So able to meet with each of those offices, talk about the things that we need, uh, make sure they're aware of the things that are going on in Dubuque, but then also um, work with groups like, again, the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, um, make connections with folks from the Department of Transportation, from the White House um, Intergovernmental Affairs Office. Um, it, you know, as, as a city, we, we have a lot of great connections because of these trips that we take and the ways that we work with these different agencies at the federal government level and, um, and, and also with our, our congressional delegation, whoever that may be at any time. I think it's really important that we continue to foster those partnerships and work really hard to keep those relationships strong. So I was um, happy to be able to represent Dubuque in that way. Hopefully did so well. I also wanted to mention that um, I, th I think since the last time we were together, I you know I, I know I've mentioned that I'm um, the president elect for the Iowa League of Cities uh, for this year, but in, in that role I'm also the chair of the Legislative Policy Committee that meets weekly and sort of oversees and advises the um, Iowa League on what we're going to discuss and how we're going to move um, legislation forward or try to advocate for certain legislation at the Iowa Legislature. Uh, it's a busy busy time right now in the Iowa Legislature, so. Um, you know, I think it's important that uh, as we that we all pay attention to the things that are going on. There are bills moving that would continue to preempt city authority. There are also bills moving that could be helpful for cities. So again, the relationships that we form in Des Moines with our with our legislators um, that are in our entire region are incredibly important. So I'm happy to to be able to to represent Dubuque in that way as well. A couple things to put on our radar. Um, speaking of Des Moines, I'll start there. We have Des Moines or Dubuque night in Des Moines coming up in March. So uh, make sure if we're able to go there, I think it's always helpful to have the city council there. Um, some of us will be playing music there, so I'm, I'm sure that they'll be there automatically, um, entertaining us for at least one more time, I understand. Mm -hmm. And then um, there is also the um, Dubuque Area Chamber fly-in in in Washington, D.C. in March. And I know that's a difficult time for all of us. We can't always all be there for that. But if they're at all able to make it, it's it doesn't often feel, I don't th think we often recognize the importance while we're there of those connections that we make, but they are really important. I mean, last year we, we had a real impact on people when we were all able to show up in the way we did. So hopefully that's on your radar as well. All right, with that, we have a closed session, so I'll entertain a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that the City Council go into closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss confidential records in purchase or sale of real estate. Motion by Sprank. Motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. For the record, the attorney the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in a closed session is city attorney Crenna Brumwell. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We are in closed session. <laughs>